It's time to unravel the secrets of successful entrepreneurship. And uh, our first session is going to be a fireside chat between Vinny Vansal, India's prolific serial entrepreneur. Happy to have you here. And Ranu Vora, co-founder, MD and CEO of Avendus Capital. Ranu heads Avendus and is responsible for its overall growth. He has spent the last 20 years in the Indian financial services industry, concluding several marquee transactions in investment banking and private equity. From being known as cool startups operating from above a garage in Mumbai in 1999, to becoming a company of 325 plus employees that is consistently ranked as India's top name in investment banking, wealth management, asset management, and credit. Both our panelists are from IIT Mumbai. And ladies and gentlemen, I give to you Vinny Bansal and Ranu Vora. Really happy to have you here. So, is this audible? Yeah. So, um, thank you to Ty uh, for for organizing this as as always and uh, for getting us all together. Uh, there is a lot of josh buzz uh, across uh, at Avendis. Uh, I can't help uh, share with you a small story uh, of how we started. Uh, so we, we didn't have any capital, we were just thinking of ideas and I still remember going to one of the Thai events in Bangalore where we met our investors and that's how, you know, it all began for us. So, you know, for us it's a, it's a story which, uh, which kind of uh, began with Thai, so we have a lot to kind of thank Thai for. Uh, I, I saw Pradeep talking a lot about Mumbai and what needs to be done to Mumbai. So we have done something, we have imported an entrepreneur from Bangalore. Uh, so, so Bini, uh, and, and as like all good things, you know, if, you know, we have great entrepreneurs here, but we also need greatness from other places. So, so Bini is here with us and um, I'll give you a very quick introduction uh, to Bini for those of you who um, do not know about him. Uh, Bini hails from Chandigarh, uh, quite close to the place where I hail from. Uh, went to IIT Delhi, uh, uh, you know, again, something which we share in common, and then, you know, worked with Amazon uh, for a very short period of time, and the whispers are that uh, Jeff Bezos didn't like when you left, <laughs> you know, had a, had a material impact on how soon he could reach that trillion dollar mark. Uh, but, but anyways, I think great for India, uh, you know, Bini and his co-founder started uh, Flipkart in 2007. Uh, Benny was the chief operating officer, you know, led the business, the engine behind the growth of the company. And in 2016 was the CEO, was appointed the CEO of the company. And of course, you know, it's been a great, great story for us, a story we need to be proud of. Uh, you know, a company which got created and built from scratch. Uh, so, so please join me in welcoming Benny uh, here. <laughs> Thanks, Ranu. Uh, pleasure to be here and talking to all of you. I just want to highlight that I'm yet to be a serial entrepreneur. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think he, uh, you know, serial entrepreneur is something which, which we uh, kind of talked about. But uh, <clears throat> so I think, you know, Bini, I'm going to, there's no fire here, but there's a fireside chat. Yeah. So, so let's take it with that pinch of salt. Um, I have kind of tried to structure my questions around two or three areas. You know, one area is around your journey in Flipkart, you know, and, and you know, kind of talk about what were the highlights of that journey. Second is more around the environment and the opportunities you see for entrepreneurs who are looking to start businesses or have started businesses on what they should be doing or not doing. And third is, of course, you know, to find out, if you can, in this short chat, on what is the magic, mantra, masala, whatever is required for a company to grow from scratch and become as large as you were able to create. 
Um, I can, I can tell you it's not easy to build a company of this scale and size in India with all the headwinds, all the issues. It's, it's not easy to build businesses. So, so kudos to what you have done. So let's start with, you know, Flipkart and the story at Flipkart. So first of all, you know, when did you get this feeling? At what stage did you get this feeling that this is a company which is going to become a unicorn? And you know, if you can narrate one or two instances which just made you feel that this is a company which is going to get there. Yeah, I think that's a interesting question. Uh, and I've been, I think, hearing a lot about how many unicorns we have, how many we could, could have. And, uh, and I truly believe that's uh, definitely the path that we are uh, on. But I think becoming, I mean, getting, uh, becoming a unicorn is something which kind of happens. Uh, and I think the way, actually maybe it happens because you don't think about becoming a unicorn. Yeah. So, so maybe the trick is actually to focus on the business, customers, market, employees, uh, and the process may uh, a unicorn. We actually never, it just happened to us. I think we, we never were thinking about, and there was actually the term unicorn probably wasn't there when we became one. So, so it wasn't marketed as much as it is today. So actually never. So. We never felt, oh, we are becoming going to be a unicorn or anything. We just were doing what we were doing. And then, I mean, we raised money and I mean, we became a unicorn. Maybe three, four years later, we discovered that, oh, we are a unicorn. So <laughs> that's, that's nice. Uh, and Benny and I were chatting before this talk. And uh, just for you entrepreneurs to know how capital efficient the company was, it raised all of $30 million to reach the unicorn mark, billion dollar mark all of about $30 million. Yeah. And so, you know, uh, you know, we joke there are two ways to make a unicorn. One is to create value of billion dollars. Second is to get investment of one billion and think you become a unicorn. So, so this was more a case where on, on the back of $30 million of capital, this value was created. So let's talk about the, the key ingredients which went into that. Uh, talk to us about the two of you, the two co-founders who started that. How did it kind of, you know, come around and how, how did you kind of create magic together? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, I think all interesting things in life are sort of, uh, I think a lot of serendipity has to happen to, to get where you are in life, I guess. And uh, so it was a lot of serendipity. So actually Sachin and I knew of each other in IIT. We're both from IIT Delhi. Uh, we both uh, passed out in 2005. And we both knew each other, but we weren't friends. Uh, but then when we came to Bangalore for our respective jobs, uh, we became close friends because we were sort of eight to ten people from the same batch of IIT Delhi, uh, uh, mostly from computer science, uh, uh, working different jobs but uh, living uh, in a couple of apartment buildings close by and hanging out together a lot. And uh, then uh, Sachin was already in Amazon. I joined Amazon a year and a half after uh, I came to Bangalore. Uh, Sachin actually referred me uh, in Amazon. And, uh, but after a couple of months of joining Amazon, uh, both he and I had, I think in parallel, started thinking about uh, doing something on our own. I really didn't, uh, there was not much work uh, allotted to me, uh, thankfully, at Amazon, so I was really bored. <laughs> so it was like a, people talk about like nine to five job or something like that. For me, it was like a 12 to three job or something. <laughs> so I used to get to office by 12 p.m and uh, I would serve the internet for an hour, then go for lunch, <laughs> then finish lunch, play table tennis, then uh, it will be three, three o'clock, and then maybe come back. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, so did that for two, three months. I was like, okay, this is not what, why I'm here. So, and uh, Sachin also had similar ideas. So, so that's where the whole idea of just starting something, doing something uh, germinated just because of sheer I would say just boredom and just lack of purpose of not doing anything. Uh, and one thing led to another. We looked at various spaces uh, and we kind of narrowed down to, okay, let's do e-commerce. Uh, for uh, And we had no idea of doing any business. So I think ignorance was bliss. If we had known what, we, what it would take, like coding was the easiest part of e-commerce uh, for us. Like going operations, going to, uh, going to vendors, convincing them to uh, come on board. Like we had, we were a couple of techies uh, with very low people skills. So, so we had 
that was like super, super difficult. I remember we talked to like 25, 30 vendors all across Bangalore and just two of them came on board in the initial days. So it was just very difficult. And uh, we had no idea how to do it uh, ourselves, but uh, uh, we kept, uh, kept at it. So yeah, so that is uh, the way it started. And I quit Amazon, uh, I think small anecdote, to within like seven, eight months. So joined in Jan 2007, quit in August or September 2007. And Sachin had got a referral bonus to refer me <laughs> in Amazon. So, so he had to pay it back. So, Payback time. So, no, he had to pay it back to Amazon because you, if you leave yeah. before a year, you have to pay it back. So he still curses me. <laughs> to this day. That is that is so so interesting. So, so when you started the company, you know, we've seen a lot of startups have to pivot their business model at different points of time. What were the one or two moments in your entrepreneurial journey when Flipkart had to flip, you know, kind of pivot? Yeah, I think uh, for us it was, we were lucky, so we, uh, our in initial idea was to start a comparison shopping engine, um, but uh, we didn't build it because when we were doing our research and looking at different uh, e-commerce websites out there, which we would have to integrate with to sort of uh, show on a platform for comparison, we figured out that there is no good e-commerce website in India, so, and that's, we just pivoted with the idea itself that, okay, let's then just build e-commerce. And after we started with books and uh, uh, we got it going, uh, I think it was, took us six months to uh, get uh, uh, a decent traction and uh, with the uh, SEO and online marketing going. And since then we started scaling 30% month over month. So we had never, we had no time to pivot or anything. We, we were just, we had started scaling crazily since like after six months of launch, luckily. Great, great. And, uh, you know, you were also mentioning very passionately about the people you kind of hired and, and I think, you know, one of the key reasons for the success was the kind of people you had with you. Uh, so so how, how was it different? You know, what were you doing differently? Uh, were you making mistakes? Were you kind of doing things right? I mean, how, how were you kind of picking up people? And some of them, by the way, have gone on to start their own companies. All now. of them, yeah. All of them. So, <laughs> So that's always a sign of a great company yeah. where entrepreneurs have created leaders within the firm. So, so what what was the difference there? Yeah, I don't know what the I, th I don't I don't know what the difference was. I can tell you what we were doing and not doing, uh, and we made our uh, our own mistakes. I think uh, so. As I said, we had started scaling like 30% month over month. So, which means like we were doubling every quarter, right? And you can't sustain that kind of growth uh, without really building your team, without having people who can, uh, who can scale uh, with the business with you. Uh, so for us, it was kind of a necessity that uh, to, if we had to keep scaling at that pace, we had to, have, we had to get the right people. So uh, I think we were kind of forced a little bit uh, into, into it as well. And I think the good thing we did maybe was uh, we were quite open to let go. So, basically get the right person and then give all the responsibility to the person. <laughs> so, okay. so once, once you've built trust, I think once you get the right person, once, so the right person means that once the person is in and has shown sort of the uh, intuitive ability to uh, do what you need from the person and kind of there is a culture match, wavelength match, all of that, that's when you can see control. And I think we learned that, like I can say that in hindsight today, like, that that's the process, but you learn that through many mistakes. So, so we would have to hire the right two, like three to four people, we would have hired 10 and maybe let go of six. So, so you will make uh, mistakes uh, doing that because uh, uh, early on it's difficult to uh, get all of it right. But I think that's what worked for us, that finally we hired the three, four sort of people who, uh, who could do what we could do, or better than we could do and actually not we, what we could do because that wouldn't scale. And uh, that's why... Uh, which, which area was it hardest to get people in? Well, I think at uh, that time, every area. I mean, you're, when you're a small startup in e-commerce in India, there's like nobody has done e-commerce, right? So, so we could not get anybody with experience. Uh, so our uh, simple, again, we were forced into a mantra where you just hire uh, brilliant people with uh, very high culture fit. Uh, and very pas passionate people, and uh, you give them things, challenges which they've never solved. Uh, so that that's how we you know, kind of did it. So in, whether it was merchandising operations, uh, it was uh, really really 
uh, hard to find experienced talent. So we just hired the best people from uh, the best colleges, whether engineering or MBAs, or, uh, and with three to five years experience who were willing to do new things. Uh, so that was our, uh, our goal. I think today the ecosystem is different. Today there's definitely talent available who has, which has worked at Ola, Flipkart, uh, or uh, other startups. So today you can hire some mid-management folks who, will, who can come in and from day one uh, help uh, start helping you in ways uh, which you which you need, but at our time there was that talent wasn't available. Okay. Awesome. So uh, you know if I if you were to just uh, you know turn back the clock and you know look at your evolution as a firm, what would you have done differently? You know if you had to start it back all over again, what are the things you would have done differently? I think uh, like ninety percent would be different. I think ten percent of the core principles would be the same. Uh, which is why uh, we went so uh, we we have come so far and uh, there's a long way to go still. But uh, I think uh, in hindsight, obviously, the, uh, there's just so much learning that uh, how uh, we would execute would be different. But I think the things which we would not change again are a uh, few things. I think from the early days, we set uh, the bar on a few things very high. So on just customer experience, the bar was very high, and that was the highest priority for the company. So the most important metric was just customer NPS. So nothing could come in the way of customer NPS. So that I would not change. I would not change the bar we set for the talent uh, on both culture and uh, just intrinsics uh, and smartness so, uh, in all areas, uh, and especially in technology. So, uh, so that I would not change. And third, I would uh, not change. I think we also kind of uh, uh, evolved into a culture where being audacious was very important because nobody had done e-commerce, nobody had done things at scale uh, in a startup in India. So anybody saying it can't be done wasn't okay. So at Flipkart, the, the thing to say was that, yeah, if it hasn't been done, doesn't mean it cannot be done. We will, we will think big and we'll change the paradigm. So that's what we call audacity. So I think that, that I won't change. That's awesome. And, uh, you know, coming to one of the things which was around the end game at Flipkart, you know, and uh, frankly, you know, you were the poster child for Indian companies and how they can become exceptionally large. And, and I was kind of trifle disappointed when this whole, I read the news on, about Walmart and this is just personal. Uh, why didn't you list the company? Why didn't you do other things? Why, why the end game, the way it unraveled? Yeah, I think, again, end, end game is a... I guess a function of uh, too many external variables. Uh, everything is not in your control. So I think given the way uh, the capital markets are, given the way competition is out there, given the way it was going to evolve, I think continuing on the treadmill of uh, raising more capital because you have to fight competition uh, 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 at every step on capital. Like on other things, it's still like fair game, it's easy to fight. but if there's sort of, uh, you have to keep fighting uh, on the capital side, then, I mean, that's an external factor. And yeah, it's easy to say that, okay, uh, it could be listed and all that, but I think then you have to make an informed choice of what is the best way forward for the company. Yeah. And we felt that uh, with the Walmart transaction, the was kind of the best way forward because then you actually at least take the capital competition away. And then you are competing on talent, on your customer experience core things which matter, which, which are in your control. So, so I think that was the sort of core thought behind uh, doing what we did on the, on the end game. Interesting. So, uh, you know, one of the things which, which I'll go from Flipkart to the, the broader kind of question and the environment, and I think one of the things which faces every entrepreneur is as you start the businesses, there are so many well-funded large companies, very often multinationals, and it's a nightmarish scenario for people when people tell you oh, Amazon will get into this or Geo will get into that or whatever. So what's your kind of frank advice to entrepreneurs as they look at that scenario and they look at, you know, a market which is open, well-funded competitors and MNCs coming in? Yeah, I think, see, uh, so, uh, and I guess believe the audience is also quite uh, early stage audience. So I think at the early stage, all these things are really not very relevant. I think what is relevant is uh, you find a niche where uh, where you find a secret which nobody else knows. The big companies are not going to play, uh, even if they want to, because uh, of various factors. And uh, and you really focus on that. 
and uh, there are just i mean I, and i would my belief is there are just so many opportunities out there because i mean because of uh, the technological change in the last 15 20 years especially in the last 5 10 years uh, everything in every sector is Uh, can be done in a much more efficient, Give us much some more examples. scalable way. I think I think the entrepreneurs here would love to way. know where are the opportunities. What what I mean, you your take, mind is coming in the next 10 years? I mean, you take any sector. You take healthcare, or you take fintech, or uh, even education. Uh, so, uh, I just recently invested in a company which is helping developers learn. Uh, developers become better developers, or learn, or not non-developers learn coding uh, faster, right? And today's if you think uh, that's actually a good example because there are companies today which do that uh, but all of that is like content based you read something or you look, uh, look at a video and then you learn and uh, and you apply now this company is because of the uh, technology evolution is able to now gamify the whole process so instead of reading content or uh, watching videos first you actually start with a problem coding problem and then because technology uh, today allows you to do this they are able to use technology to guide you through the problem solving right uh, while you are problem solving they'll guide you to the right content uh, so it's and it's gamified so uh, there's more interest uh, which uh, any person will have in going through that program so uh, now this was not possible 10 years ago 10 years ago you could not build this company but today you can build a gamified uh, e learning uh company so education as we know it uh, uh classroom teaching and all of that like kind of needs to change on its head and uh, there's just so much opportunity this is just helping developers learn uh, faster there are so many different skills to be learned so there's so many different companies to be created in just this space so i think uh, there's just a ton of opportunity and, to do and new things when you kind of look at these opportunities and and i know you are also uh you know you mentioned about wearing the investor hat now sometimes and and trying to invest in behind these companies what are the key things you are looking for when you are investing in these companies so it depends uh, i think early stage uh, uh, so i've done uh, mostly early stage investment some some mid stage as well so i think early stage uh, there are i mean not a lot of data you can look at so uh, i think the few things i look at one is obviously the market i mean uh, the market and the vision of the entrepreneur if Uh, the entrepreneur is looking at a big uh, is it solving a big problem uh, finally not the starting problem doesn't need to be big but finally what you build the vision needs to sort of uh, take you to be solving some big problem you, you should start with a small problem uh, so market and vision and uh, then the founding team obviously i mean uh, the uh, how and more from again soft from a soft side what are they passionate about why are they doing this Uh, the why is very important uh, so uh, is it about impact or is it just about creating valuation so uh, i would rather invest in people who are thinking about customers and impact rather than people who are thinking about building a billion dollar company or a unicorn or whatever uh, and then uh, what have they done till now i mean what is the traction what do they think what have they achieved how did they learn what are their in insights what is the secret behind their model so I think these three, four things, and then it's an intuitive call on whether to invest or not at an early stage. Yeah, that's 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 a good uh, that's a good uh, insight. Um, you know, as you look at now, Benny the person. You know, five years from now, uh, you've already been clubbed as a serial entrepreneur. <laughs> uh, what what is coming ahead? Is it Benny the investor, Benny the entrepreneur? Is it both? What is it likely to be for the next five years for you? I think it's yeah too early, too early to ask. Uh, so I'm kind of uh, taking uh, uh, in an exploration mode, uh, spending a lot of time with the uh, family. I have two young children, uh, twin boys, uh, two-year-old. So spending a lot of time there. I think one or two things which are clear, which I want to do as a theme is just help entrepreneurs. So uh, in that sense, some investing, and then uh, I've uh, also. Uh, Kind of seeded this company called X Two Ten X along with uh, one of my ex uh, colleagues, uh, Sai Kiran, and uh, the idea is there to help a uh, little bit more late stage companies. So it's X Two Ten X. So how do you, after you have product market fit, after uh, you have momentum, let's say you've raised your Series A or B, 
and you really need to scale. I mean, the product market fit is there, you really need to scale. Uh, how can you get, what is the help you need? Uh, there is uh, a lot that can go wrong in scaling up your organization or your processes or supply chain, uh, even basic things like your financial management, uh, uh, your uh, legal contracts, uh, all of those things. So, so that's uh, one thing which uh, I've kind of seeded, uh, but apart from that, uh, taking time off right now. <laughs> okay, nice, good to know. So, um, you know, the, the other part which I wanted to touch upon, which is something which being in the digital industry is very important to all of us, is about governance in the new age entrepreneurial ventures. And I know that there is always that treadmill and people are trying to get to the numbers. And, uh, but what would be your kind of reflection or insight into governance in, in some of the new generation? And what's your advice to entrepreneurs on that? Yeah, so I think, uh, so maybe that all, this also goes back to the, uh, I think one of the first questions you asked that what would I change or not change? I think the other thing maybe I would not change is just uh, that we always thought long term. That, uh, and that's why customer experience was important. Focus on just books category for the first three years was important. Everybody else was selling everything. In, uh, uh, our competition at that time was selling like all categories. We were only selling books, uh, but we never got carried away. Uh, so, uh, so I think just uh, for any startup, I think it's long journey, so, and you have to build trust with so many different people, with the customers, with your uh, uh, partners or vendors, with your investors, and it's end of the day, it's about your personal brand and the brand of the company, which will uh, carry you forward. So, uh, and governance is a key part of building that brand, doing the right thing uh, is, is very, very crucial. Uh, there will be, uh, if there are short-term pressures, I think the long term can never, it should never get in the way of the long term trust building or the long term governance around the company because uh, at some point uh, that catches up with you. So, so I think it's very, very, very important. I can't stress more because, uh, because also, I mean, the way the ecosystem is, also the VC model is sort of built in a way where uh, once you get funding, you have to show growth, you have to chase numbers. So I think it's also comes with the, just the territory which we play in, so it can lead to short-term behavior. It's very easy to get into that trap, so you have to be super, super conscious uh, to really think long-term and not short-term when that happens. That's great. So, um, you know, I, I love doing this uh, in my fireside chats, but I'm going to do a rapid-fire oh, Q&A okay. with you. Uh, please I'm not good me. at rapid-fires. Yeah. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so let's start. Um, what doesn't let you sleep in the night? Oh, nothing. I, I sleep at least eight to ten hours uh, a night. I think what would not let me sleep at night is not sleeping at night, so it's kind of recurse of that. <laughs> what makes you get out of bed every morning? Um, I think it is uh, different things at different times. Like today it's about, I think uh, it's uh, about helping entrepreneurs. But I think it's really about whatever I'm passionate about at that time, just teasing that, what I really feel strongly about. So. Uh, so it used to be obviously five years back, ten years back, uh, really the Flipkart customer, and uh, how can we uh, deliver more products faster, cheaper uh, to them? Today it's uh, probably a bit different. Yeah. The first word which comes to your mind when I say the alphabet F? Facebook. No. <laughs> Flipkart. Yeah, obviously. I think Google knows that well. Like in Chrome, when you type F. And for the first two times, it will show Facebook, but then it starts showing Flipkart, so. <laughs> Bangalore or Silicon Valley, your pick? I think, yeah, I guess both. I think both are, it's hard to pick. Pick. Yeah. Okay, I don't know what I'm picking for, so. <laughs> sure. One prediction you would stick your neck out for? One prediction? I think, I don't know. Uh, Except the election results. <laughs> That's a prediction which is a... Yeah, I think uh, somebody said we'll see like a 50 or 100 uh, unicorns. Unicorns, yeah. yeah. I think, yeah, probably more. Yeah. Wow, that's, wow. that's great. Uh, so you, all of us have some opportunity there. Uh, what does a billion dollars look like? <laughs> yeah. I think... Uh, at, 
from one perspective it looks like a lot, from one perspective it looks uh, very less, so I'll tell you <laughs> how it can look less as well. So, so yeah, so I think it is, uh, there's, I don't see any difference between like say 10 million or a billion because after a certain point, money is utility loses value, right? So, uh, so from that perspective it is, uh, it's setting too much. Uh, but from the other perspective where, as I said, there could be uh, way more than 50 or 100 unicorns, it's much lesser because I see that there's going to be a lot more opportunity to, to invest than just a billion dollars. So, so I think just, uh, from that perspective, it's actually very small. Sure. Just remember when the utility becomes lower and lower, there are a lot of entrepreneurs who might have a higher need for it. That's what I'm saying. That's, <laughs> that's, that's the second part, right? So it's, it's much lesser because, uh, if you look at from a perspective of investing because there's just so much opportunity to invest. So, and that's what uh, at least uh, I plan to do, yeah. Uh, what if you had continued with Amazon? What if I had continued with Amazon? Yeah, I don't know, maybe... Hmm, that's an interesting one. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> table tennis. Yeah. We would have a new table tennis champ? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. I was not very good at it. <laughs> so. Entrepreneur you admire the most? Oh, uh, there are quite a few. Uh, I think, uh, so there's, uh, I admire uh, Reed Hastings of Netflix. Uh, I think he has uh, pivoted multiple times. Uh, like he really keeps changing and learning from what he does. Uh, and uh, I think the pivot that they made from selling CDs to actually producing content yeah. uh, is just amazing. And the culture they've built is, is also pretty amazing. So uh, yeah, I think that's one of probably the lesser known entrepreneurs or followed entrepreneurs as well, but pretty interesting to see what, uh, how he's sort of done things. That's great uh, insight for all of us. Um, well, that kind of, you know, our time's up and this clock's kind of just on my face, just blinking. Uh, so, but I'll st still use my powers, you know, to get two questions from the audience for you. And, you know, if you, any of you have had, uh, you know, kind of, I, I don't know if the mic's around. Yeah, perfect. So, please, please do raise your hand. And the way we see a person here in the center. Yeah, hi Vinny and Ranu. So uh, my question is in continuation to your previous one. Uh, that is your advice for uh, the new and the budding entrepreneurs. Uh, the question goes like this. So from, from techie to being and, sustain, being and sustaining as founders and CXOs, what exercises did you do to reinvent, rediscover, evolve? Oh, you mean re uh, invent, rediscover yourself? For yourself. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's a great question. I think that's... And, uh, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I will add one more question to this. That is, how did you keep on maintaining your synergies with your co-founder? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so I think uh, on the first one, uh, where I think it is, uh, that's also a critical sort of sign which I kind of look at uh, in the later stage investments where... Uh, I think it's very important to see whether the founders have scaled, will scale, and how does that process work. I think uh, for me personally, it was basically about every 18 months really reflecting on what is working, what is not working, uh, uh, and uh, it generally happened when things were not working in the business. So then uh, you can't blame anybody else. So then you have to look inwards and you have to say, okay, what am I doing wrong? And uh, uh, and I think from there you kind of figure out uh, what needs to change and consciously sort of work on that. And that, I think at Flipkart happened every 18 months. I think every 18 months uh, there would be some crisis or the other and then you have to uh, kind of mostly look inwards and, uh, and change things. Uh, so on the second one, I think it's, uh, that's also a very key question, uh, especially in the early days. I think. Uh, it helps uh, to really define the values, principles of uh, uh, values and culture and the common principles of how you will do business, uh, how you want to treat your employees, your customers, your partners, because that's where friction really comes uh, when you're not aligned on your principles and values. So, uh, I think being explicit about it probably early on and uh, 
uh, and then working through them is probably a good idea. We never did that at Flipkart, uh, but uh, we were again lucky to have actually the same uh, uh, thoughts on most of these. Uh, uh, and uh, that really helped. But I think uh, for uh, founding teams, probably a good idea in hindsight to really maybe document some of that and and uh, really uh, debate it out uh, to be on the same page. Great. Thank you. Uh, one more question. Here, the, the gentleman here. The side. Hi, Vinny. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So my question is uh, uh, that all of us here are all belonging to tech backgrounds, like there are so many tech startups in India and it's booming on tech startups. What's your view on, uh, on uh, long-term startups more on the science side? And how does that evolve in India? Startups that sort of don't, are not going to become a unicorn, but are sort of venturing into more complex solutions, fundamental solutions, fundamental sciences, like, for example, cure for cancer or for truly sustainable uh, materials and alternatives. So what's, what's the view on that? And uh, how's, how's that going to evolve in India? And where's that right now? What do you see that as? Yeah, I think that uh, kind of is, uh, at least my view is it is very much related to the ecosystem also we have uh, around education and uh, and our industry. So we, I think in India, we obviously don't, do not have very deep research or very deep uh, uh, research happening uh, across most of uh, these disciplines and hence talent pool in most of these is quite shallow. So, so I think there are a few companies uh, and very, very interesting companies uh, doing work uh, in this area, but I don't see it becoming like a huge trend unless the whole education ecosystem evolves uh, and becomes really deep research, deep into research. So, so we'll probably see some of it happening. And uh, I've actually invested in three or four uh, very early stage uh, companies because again, the VC ecosystem doesn't really uh, uh, is not attuned for these kind of investments. So maybe angels can do, a, I mean, a lot more uh, in that space. But it's hard to see that whole thing scaling just because of talent. I think talent is a huge, huge challenge. Even if you get started, then I've seen like after two years, four years, one year, once you have uh, built something interesting, then you kind of uh, have to move uh, either uh, somewhere else outside India because that that is the only way to scale. So I think, uh, so I think probably good to get started here, get figure out uh, some success, and then take it out. I guess that's great. Uh, so that brings us to a close of this session. Bini, thank you for you know setting this vision. Thank you. Setting the vision for the company and and creating such a play which, you know, all revolutions need some success stories. So this is the one for the records. So thank you again. Thank you, my pleasure. Thank you, Bini. Thank you, Ranu. And I request Ranu to felicitate Bini. Ladies and gentlemen, I request you to please settle down. We will be continuing with our next session. I request you to please settle down. We will continue with our next session. There wouldn't be a tea break, but post that session, we will definitely have a break. And uh, I request you to be on stage, yes. <laughs> I would request Praveen Gandhi to felicitate Mr. Ranu Vora. Ladies and gentlemen,